Hi, my name is Tim Hesford, and today I will be performing a piece of James Mincher's novel, Chesapeake. The story I will be performing is of Captain John Smith's interaction with the Chop Tank people in his famous expedition up the Chesapeake Bay. John Smith was an English explorer who played a huge role in the establishment of the Jamestown Colony in 1607. He is often regarded as a folk hero on the eastern shore of Maryland and Virginia for making the first well-documented exploration up the bay. It was a cold and blustery day in mid-December, 1606. Captain John Smith, a short, chloretic, opinionated little man with a, beard and, with a beard and fiery temper, assembled seven men on the dock in London. Addressing them in crisp terms, he said, Gentlemen, today I have brought you here to inspect the vessels in which we shall conquer Virginia. The Godspeed, the Discovery, and the Susan Constant. Surveying his fleet, he prepared himself to embark on his finest adventure yet. The establishment of a new colony and the subjugation of a new world. Fast forward two years to 1608 and Captain John Smith and his crew are in Jamestown, the first settlement in the Americas. The first English settlement in the Americas. Infuriating, he growled one July day in 1608. Three years ago I heard all the facts for myself. Silver more common than copper. Kitchen pans and bedroom pots made of pure gold. Rubies and diamonds littered the streets, children collecting pearls in the streams. The riches are here, if only we can find them. On Saturday, August 9th, he outlined his plan to his crew. The gold lies, I'm convinced, in towns along the eastern shore of the bay, and there we shall search most thoroughly. The passage to India probably lies on the northern end, so we shall first find the gold, then continue north, after we find the passage, we shall return to Jamestown with our prophets. Among his crew was Edmund Steed. Edmund Steed had not participated in either of his earlier in either of Smith's earlier explorations, but he had been selected for one particular purpose. Smith had not been entirely pleased with the narrative provided from his previous record keeper on his two on his two preliminary journeys up the bay. They had been accurate, however, they according to Smith had paid insufficient attention to his moral and heroic qualities. This time, he was determined that his accomplishments would not go undocumented. As the crew departed from Jamestown, Steed took careful notes of the ship, lest he omit any significant details about their departure. There was no decking, no refuge from storms, barrels of bread were already turning sour, a batch of dried meats with worms mixed in, and a large supply of fishing lines. There'll be plenty of fish, the captain assured his crew. If the gentlemen felt any apprehension about exploring with such inadequate gear, the captain surely did not. So the shallop sailed north, and as they continued up the bay, they explored the Nanticoke and Wicomico rivers. On a trade expedition with the, with the Nanticoke people, Smith learned of a great river to the north, with a city of gold called Patamoke. So the shallop sailed north, and when the great, when the great broad river was sighted, Smith cried, this is our chop tank. Here lies Patamook, City of Gold. That evening, the, the ship anchored well up the river under the protection of a white cliff. Behind the cliff, two canoes appeared in the distance, announcing in sign language that their leader, the Werewants, desired the strangers to accompany them back to their capital city, where they would be welcomed. The Englishmen debated whether this was a wise decision for their captain to accompany them on this journey. But by dawn, Smith had made his decision. I must go to Patamook, for there we shall find our gold. No argument would dissuade him, and when light broke, he nominated Churgan Ragnall and Edmund C. to accompany him. The short trip from the cliff to the city was one of intense excitement, Steve remembered, for the captain could smell the gold in the air. In, as in, in Captain Smith's anticipation, he told Steed, when they meet us with a great procession, I will go first, and you march behind me with Ragnall in proper form in order that we can impress them with our military bearing. Steed took notes of what actually happened. After passing a large, beautiful marsh filled with birds and waving brushes, we approached our long-desired goal, the city of Patamook, headquarters of the powerful chop tanks who control this river. As we approached, our hearts beat fast. When they arrived in the village and the captain only saw a circle of wigwams, a mound of oyster shells, and nothing more, he looked at his companions blankly. No silver, no gold, no pearls, no rubies, no emeralds. To him, these people were small and lacking in dignity. 
except for one tall, broad-shouldered man who stood out of the crowd. He had turkey feathers in his hair, and his name was Pinktacoon. Captain Smith, sorely disappointed from this village, felt that he must at least go through the motions of trade. So from his bag, he produced glass beads, colorful cloth, a hatchet, and for their werewants, a final present, a compass. The young werewants took it in his hand, moved it in circles, and watched as the needle danced home to its assigned position, no matter which way he oriented it. He had never seen anything like this and was bewildered. Not knowing a word of their language, Captain Smith tried his best using body motions and hand movements to try to explain that the compass point nor pointed north. He did so by describing the Great Dipper with his hands, which contains the North Star. His gestures were incomprehensible to most people present, but to Pinktacoon, they were beginning to make sense. He reached for a stick and traced out the stars of the Great Dipper in the dust, after which Captain Smith explained, Yes, further explanation was not needed, for Pinktacoon had already concluded that the Great Dipper contained the North Star and that the compass saw north. After trade was finished, the, in, the chop tanks hosted the explorers at a feast where bear meat and crab cakes were served. After they ate, Captain Smith dispatched Cherrigan back to the ship with news that they, were all, that they were well and that him and Steed would return in the morning. When they returned, Steed faced the task of describing this adventure. He wanted to be accurate and report the humble quality of the chop tank village and its people, but he also had to portray Smith in a heroic manner, which proved difficult. When the commander read his final report, he could not hide his displeasure. The real trouble here is you spend too few words on our departure. You must recall, for you were there, what a risky business we undertook. It is by no means an easy task for three men to venture unarmed into the heart of hostile Indian territory. Steve was about to say that he'd never seen a people less hostile, Indian or not, but he deemed it wiser to keep his silence. Passing the pages over to the captain, he held the lantern so that Smith could edit them. After a while, a lengthy account of their expedition to secure food for his crew, with securing food in quotations, was returned. In this account, Captain Smith accomplished this goal by boldly outsmarting a band of hostile Indians led by Pinktacoot, who sought to kill him and his two accomplices. If this wasn't enough of an exaggeration, Smith also had himself quoting Machiavelli while inspiring his men to face a band of savages, saying... The wise Machiavelli, in all his instruction to the princes, once said that men, iron, money, and bread be the necessities of war. But of these four, men and iron be of the two most important, because men and iron can find money and bread. But bread and money never find men and iron. When Steve read this dumbfounded report, he did not know where to begin. He knew that Pinktacoon was brighter than Smith. He figured that Smith hated the clever chop tank because the Indian was so much taller than him. Smith wanted him to appear stupid, but it did gall the Oxford student to have Smith quoting Machiavelli to inspire his men. Cautiously, he said to his commander, I heard no Machiavelli, to which Smith replied, well, the Indians were pressing. I had not the time. If a captain leads his men into strange waters against a strange enemy, is it wise for him to think of Machiavelli? Steed stared blankly barely at the bottom boards, barely discernible in the darkness, but Smith was not content. Tell me, Mr. Steed, why would I have gone into a canoe almost alone and ventured into the enemy camp? Men and iron obtain food. It's never the other way around. I insist that you make one more change to your story, Steed. In your account of our departure from, from the Indians, I want you to write that you volunteered most gallantly. But you commanded me to go, sir. Well, if I had not, you would have volunteered, because you, Steed, like myself, are a man of iron. Steve made no reply, and Smith moved forward in the ship, but was soon back with one more suggestion. Mr. Steve, at the moment when I met the Indian with the turkey feathers, must you emphasize the fact that I, that I am so short and he is so tall? This time, Steve wisely replied, Sir, my description was ungracious, and I will gladly change it. I believe this story provides an interesting look into what some of the interactions between early European settlers and Native Americans might have looked like on the eastern shore. It does this not only through the dialogue between Captain Smith and the Chop Tanks, but also by preventing two different worldviews in the characters. On one hand, you have Captain Smith, bold, ambitious, greedy, seemingly never satisfied with his accomplishments. 
Although he tries to appear lofty, in reality, at any given moment, everything the captain has worked so hard to accomplish in the New World is hanging on by a thread. The settlers in Jamestown, including Smith, have suffered greatly from starvation and drought, only surviving with the help of the local Powhatan villages. Then on the other hand, you have Pinktacoot. He's portrayed as a strong and wise figure who lives comfortably off the land with the chop tanks. I would argue that John Smith found a city of gold when he beached his canoe in Patamote. He was just unfortunately too blind to see it. In order to capture these two conflicting outlooks, I drew heavily from Pelias, doing the best I could to focus on becoming the characters while reading the text. I also tried to focus on sections of the text that highlighted personality and world, the personality and worldview of each character. Unfortunately, in conclusion, English expansion eventually forced the chop tanks into a reservation around where the present-day city of Cambridge is in Dorchester County, Maryland. According to the Chop Tank River, the Chop Tank River Heritage Society, by 1790, the last of the tribe left their home in the Chesapeake in hopes of a better life out west.